identify them and how, whether or whether not to give antibiotics in the internally vexing question for, for diarrhea for adults. Um, we do have CPD points as usual. There's a link that goes out about half past the hour. So you're welcome to click on that and get your details that way. And then of course, um, if you would like to ask any questions, we welcome that, just type them in the chat. Or if you wanna ask them orally, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, I think that's it for me. So welcome Sharon, we're really looking forward to it. Thanks, Jeremy. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, so I'm Sharon, I'll be presenting diarrheal pathogens and I have um, the task of making diarrhea sound interesting this afternoon. So we'll start off with the definition of diarrhea. According to the World Health Organization, diarrhea is described as having three or more loose or watery stools in a 24 hour period or more frequently than is normal for an individual person. So arbitrarily, um, diarrhea is defined as uh, passing of excessively loose stools. So you look at the consistency, whether it's liquid or semi-liquid, um, based on frequency, whether it's three or more stools in a 24 hour period, and also looking at the volume. So if there's increased volume, um, uh, stool volume in a 24 hour period. You can define diarrhea according to the uh, time that it, the duration. So if it lasts for less than seven days, that's acute diarrhea. If it's um, between seven and 13 days, that's prolonged diarrhea. Between 12 and 29 days, that's persistent diarrhea. And uh, for chronic diarrhea, um, it's usually diarrhea that lasts more than 30 days. So this is a Bristol uh, stool chart and type seven illustrates um, what watery stool looks like. And this is actually a Bristol stool chart cake. And it's amazing what you can find on Pinterest um, as party ideas. So looking at the epidemiology of diarrhea, so this is from the World Health Organization. So looking at the leading causes of death globally between uh, in 2000 and in 2019, we can see that diarrheal diseases are number eight in the top 10. So in 2019, the global um, statistics with regards to uh, diarrhea related deaths in the ages between 15 and 49 were 135,892 deaths. Between 50 and 69 years, it was 233,400 deaths. And over the age of 70, it was 600,935 deaths. Um, the majority of deaths, so more than one third of deaths, were in children under the age of five. And the vast majority of these deaths occurred in South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa. Um, this is just to illustrate that the leading causes of death in a low income country. Uh, diarrheal diseases are number five. Uh, this is just to look at leading causes of death in lower middle income countries. We can see diarrheal diseases are number six. And then looking at middle to upper income countries and high income countries, diarrheal diseases don't even feature in the top 10 causes of death in these countries. Um, looking at South Africa, so deaths from diarrheal diseases by age in South Africa from 1990 to 2019, um, we can see, although there is a steady decline, there's still quite a significant incidence of uh, diarrheal deaths, um, especially at the extremes of age. So the under fives, um, death rates, uh, the number of deaths were 3,665. And in those over the age of 70, uh, it's 4,737 deaths. And this trend where there seems to be a decline in, in the number of diarrheal related deaths over the last three decades is not only seen in South Africa, but globally. And the thought behind this is that there's improved maternal education, improved child growth due to better nutrition and access to rotavirus vaccination, improvement in sanitation and widespread use of oral rehydration um, solutions. So the communities are more aware of um, being more proactive when they, um, with, with regards to self-treatment at home. This was a community survey for diarrheal diseases done in 2020 by the NICD. And uh, what they looked at was the community, so the self-reported um, prevalence of, of diarrhea at a community level. And the basis for the study was that the data for adults in an African setting with regards to diarrheal diseases is um, not a lot. There have been two studies done in Africa. So one household survey in Zambia, which reported a diarrheal rate of 1.74 episodes per year. Um, and another study done in Ethiopia that uh, 
picked up a diarrheal rate of 3.78 episodes per year for children less than the age of five. So in this survey, um, the self-reported diarrheal rate was 2.5 episodes per year and one episode per year for other household members who were not present at the time that these surveys were done. And what they had found was that many older children and adults didn't actually seek healthcare for these diarrheal episodes as most of them were reported to be mild episodes and lasted um, a duration of only about two days. And what does this, uh, what implications does this have? Um, well, the data shows that only 4.6% of cases in the community would be detected through hospital surveillance, 16.1% through clinic surveillance, and 3.4% through routine diagnostic laboratory data. So we could be um, underestimating the actual rate of um, the actual prevalence of diarrhea at a community level. So just briefly on the mechanisms of diarrhea, and this is just to um, uh, contextualize the two uh, main ways in which diarrhea may manifest itself. So you have non-inflammatory diarrhea and under non-inflammatory diarrhea, the two mechanisms will either be you have ingestion of a preformed toxin or you have ingestion of an organism that then produces the toxin in the gastrointestinal lumen. The other, the, on the other hand, you've got inflammatory diarrhea where you have non-invasive but cytotoxin producing uh, microorganisms. And the other mechanism is through invas uh, invasion by these microorganisms, which I'll elaborate a bit on um, in the next two slides. So this is just to highlight um, environmental toxigenic bacteria that produce uh, a toxin and that is ingested usually with, uh, through contaminated food and that has uh, direct effects on the mucosa. So you're not actually ingesting the microorganism itself, you're just ing ingesting the preformed toxin and that causes um, uh, disruption at a, a cellular level and causes increased secretion of um, fluid and electrolytes. Um, this here is to look at non-adherent toxigenic bacteria. So you have bacteria that's ingested and then you have the production of the toxin in the gastrointestinal lumen. And that also causes um, the same effects where it can cause um, disruption of cellular processes and increase in fluid and electrolyte secretion. The inflammatory component, you have enteroinvasive bacteria and then colonizing enterotoxigenic bacteria that cause secretion of uh, virulence factors and also can affect the intestinal mucosa and disrupt the intestinal mucosa directly. And this leads to both local and systemic effects. So this is a nice um, uh, explanation of, of mechanisms of non-inflammatory and inflammatory diarrhea taken from this paper by Nav um, Navanita. So with non-inflammatory diarrhea, you have ingestion of toxin. You have the toxin that binds to the enterocyte receptor, increased concentrations of intracellular mediators in the form of CAMP, CGMP, and calcium. And that results in activation of targets of intracellular mediators, alteration of transport proteins and ion channels, and that results in diarrhea. And then you have ingestion of organisms with bowel colonization and toxin elaboration that then um, results in the same thing. With inflammatory diarrhea, you have ingestion of the organism and intestinal colonization. You can have mucosal invasion that causes an intramucosal multiplication and acute inflammation resulting in diarrhea. Or you can have cytotoxin elaboration um, uh, causing acute inflammation and then resulting in diarrhea. So although this is a very simplified um, way of looking at diarrhea, it's just to better understand uh, the two main mechanisms in which uh, infectious diarrhea may manifest. So risk factors for, um, sorry, just to go back to the slide, um, with regards to the, the, the non-inflammatory diarrhea, usually this affects the small intestine and the patients tend to present with more gastrointestinal symptoms with a uh, few systemic signs. Whereas with the inflammatory diarrhea, it usually affects the distal ileum and colon and the patients have both gastrointestinal as well as systemic signs. And this is because of microbial dissemination with, via the bloodstream or the systemic effects of the toxins produced in the GI lumen, as well as the host inflammatory response to the infection. So when we look at uh, risk factors for diarrhea, there's three big groups. So you have environmental factors, host factors, and microbial factors to look at. With environmental factors, so lack of sanitation and access to safe water is, is an important risk factor. So um, this may increase and it, play, it, play, uh, sorry, it plays an important role in the transmission of these enteric pathogens. So um, it 
is quite a significant risk factor for the development of diarrheal diseases. You have contaminated food, so fruits, vegetables, beef, raw crop, which are commonly implicated um, <clears throat> in uh, foodborne illnesses, are uh, a common source of um, enteric pathogens. In addition to the food, one must also remember that ill food handlers are an important source for foodborne outbreaks, and then food prepared from infected animals may be contaminated when they're sold. And this, for example, we can see with zoonotic infections by Campylobacter, Salmonella, and shigatoxin producing E. coli. International travel is another risk factor for enteric infection. And this is usually when there's travel to a developing country. And the most common regions are Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, traveler's diarrhea is the most common travel-related infection. And the most common implicated organisms here are enterotoxigenic E. coli, Campylobacter, non typhoidal Salmonella, and Shigella. Seasonal patterns in temperate and tropical climates are also important to consider. So with temperate climates, you may, because, for example, during winter, you may have people that tend to congregate more together indoors, you may have an increased risk of person-to-person -person spread. Um, so in the case, for example, of norovirus, which is what's called um, winter vomiting syndrome. Um, this usually occurs during the winter months because of the close proximity of people together. You may also have increased incidences of foodborne outbreaks during the summer months, and there's increased transmission of certain microorganisms during seasonal floodings in certain areas. Behavioral factors are another thing to um, be wary of. So for example, in a hospital setting where you have seed of spores that contaminate the hospital environment and the hands of healthcare workers, um, when people don't wash their hands or there's incorrect IPC measures in place, this uh, poses a, a significant risk factor for acquiring um, enteric pathogens. Then close communities such as schools, residential facilities and cruise ships, and this is mainly because um, of the increased risk of person-to-person -person spread and hospitalization, um, for example, in the case of C. diff. Horse factors, age, so the extremes of age are most vulnerable to um, diarrheal pathogens. So in the younger children, uh, it's thought to be due to the loss of maternal antibodies and also um, due to the discontinuation of uh, breastfeeding. In the elderly, it's thought to be due to immune senescence, the altered gut microbiome, and because of more frequent use of antibiotics. Um, mucosal barriers in the form of pH and motility are important. So with pH, an um, acidic pH is very important as a barrier to enteric infections. Studies have shown that microorganisms are killed within 15 minutes in normal human stomach at a pH of four, but are viable in um, a chlorohydric stomachs for more than an hour. And the big issue here is obviously the liberal use and the frequent use of PPIs, both as inpatients and outside of the hospital setting. Intestinal motility as well helps to maintain enteric microbiota and clears pathogenic bacteria from the small intestine. So studies have shown that there's an increased complication in those who have received anti-motility agents or have underlying gastric motility disorders. The intestinal microbiome is another important host factor. So the intestinal microbiome has 100 trillion cells, which is dependent on age, the location within the intestine, geographic region of the world, host genetics, nutritional status, and prior antibiotic exposure. It prevents colonization and infection by enteric pathogens. Um, and it does this uh, because they compete with the pathogenic microorganisms for nutrients, specific niches within the intestine, maintains low luminal pHs, and produce compounds that are inhibitory to the pathogens. Immunocompromised states, and here we're looking at patients with congenital immunodeficiencies, organ transplant, those receiving chemotherapy, or other immunomodulatory drugs, and patients who have HIV infection. And they have an increased risk to acquire infection. They may have more severe disease. They may have more prolonged excretion of the enteric pathogens, and they're more susceptible to um, microorganisms, for example, like Mycobacterium avian complex and CMV, unlike an immunocompetent patient. Genetics also are important. So although there are not a lot of studies that have been done, um, a few have, uh, have centered around interleukin-8 and the variants of interleukin-8 which have been associated with an increased risk of severe C. diff and interaggregative E. coli infection. And this is due to an exaggerated in inflammatory response in those who have um, IL-8 variants. There are also individuals with O blood groups at increased risk, for example, for, uh, from uh, vibrio cholerae infections and variants of histoblood group A 
who may be in, uh, at increased risk of infection with norovirus and rotavirus. And then of course, nutritional status, um, where there's a complex interplay between the nutritional status and, and diarrhea and undernutrition, especially micronutrient deficiencies may make you um, at, uh, susceptible to infection and prolonged episodes of diarrhea. With the microbial factors, I'm not going to dwell too much on, on, on these factors, but it's just to know that there is something called the inoculum sites. So you have this concept of the ID50, which is the medium infective dose, which represents the inoculum required to infect 50% of a population. And this is dependent on the gastric acidity, intestinal motility, prior immunity, and the presence of the microbiome. And when it's low, um, it usually means that the microorganism is resistant to gastric acid and you just need a few organisms. So it can be as low as 10 to 100 microorganisms, cysts or viral particles that are enough to cause clinical disease. And this has implications because the lower the ID50 is, the greater the chance of person to person spread. And this is seen with Shigella, E. coli, cyst forms of Gerardia lamblia and with norovirus. Adherence factors and, in, um, and invasion factors. So not to go too deeply into the microbiology, but there are certain adherence factors that these microorganisms have to the host surfaces. Um, and this is through interaction of bacterial surface proteins, um, some of which are pili, and then some mediate cell to cell interactions between the bacteria to create micro colonies on the mucosal surface rather than binding to specific intestinal receptors. With regards to invasion, you have um, invasion of the intestinal epithelial cells um, or, traffic, or trafficking through these epithelial cells down to the submucosal layer. And this is usually through specific M cells um, in the intestinal mucosa. And then you have toxins, so mainly three big groups, so neurotoxins, enterotoxins, and cytotoxins. And what these toxins do is that they bind to specific receptors, are internalized, and they catalyze specific uh, enzymatic activities within the cell that leads to alterations in the cell physiology and causes secretion of fluids and electrolytes or apoptosis of specific cells. And that results in the clinical presentation of the patients. So this is just a nice table that I found that looks at the different toxins, what organism pr uh, produces them and the related toxin name. So the neurotoxin, you have Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus, Clostridium botulinum, and then enterotoxins, you have Vibrio cholerae, enterotoxigenic E. coli and Clostridium perfringens. And the cytotoxins, you have C. difficile, Shigella dysentery type one, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, Clostridium jejuni, Vibrio perihemolyticus, um, Bacillus fragilis and Clostridium perfringens. So when looking at the etiology of, um, of diarrhea, you can look at it according to the onset. So whether it's acute diarrhea or chronic diarrhea, and then within each subset, you can um, try and uh, assess whether it's small bowel diarrhea or large bowel diarrhea. And this is just to help you narrow down your differential diagnosis in terms of the, the microorganisms that could be causing the disease. So when we look at acute diarrhea, uh, remember, I had mentioned earlier that usually the non-inflammatory diarrheas mainly affect the small bowel, and here you have increased secretions, and common etiologies, are, uh, so if we start with viruses, are rotavirus, norovirus, adenovirus, and CMP, and then bacterial causes are enterotoxigenic E. coli, Clostridium perfringens, Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus, and Vibrio cholerae, and parasites are Gerardia intestinalis, Cryptosporidium, and Cyclospora. And typically, these patients have mild symptoms of mild diarrhea that is usually watery. It's not bloody with few systemic signs. With large bowel diarrhea, this is mainly inflammatory. You have invasive or toxin-producing pathogens that result in mucosal damage and tissue destruction. And the implicated organisms here are mainly bacteria. So you have uh, non-typhoidal salmonella, Shigella dysenteri, Campylobacter, Enterohemorrhagic E. coli, <clears throat> Clostridium difficile, Yersinia, uh, and Entamoeba histolytica. And this typically causes severe diarrhea that may be bloody with systemic signs. When we look at chronic diarrhea, again, you have small intestinal and colonic causes. Um, so small intestinal is mainly the parasites, so Cryptosporidium, Cyclospora, Gerardia lamblia, Cyst Isospora belli, Strongyloides, and then with the colonic um, <clears throat> Campylobacter, Salmonella, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, as well as non, um, non um, mycobacterial tuberculosis, and then parasites like amoeba, Trichuris, and Schistosoma. Don't forget viruses like CNV, and then fun even fungi like Blastomyces, Histoplasmosis, and Canada if you're in the correct demographics. <clears throat> 
So this is just to clinically assist you with trying to tell the difference between small and large bowel. And um, these four characteristics may um, of, of the stool on history may be able to give you an idea of whether this is small bowel and large bowel. Obviously, this is not strictly speaking, but it's just to give you a, a guide, a rough guide, as to where, um, where the diarrhea could be originating from. So if we're looking at a Appearance. If it's watery, it's more likely to be small bowel. But of course, large bowel diarrhea can be watery, but you uh, but um, usually can be mucoid or bloody. With the volume, small bowel is large, um, and large bowel is small. Frequency is increased with small bowel, and large bowel is excessively increased. And then with um, with regards to the presence of blood, it could be present, but usually it's not gross. And with large bowel, it's usually grossly um, bloody. So looking at the um, clinical presentation, so you have acute dysenteric syndromes. So this is defined as small frequent small bowel movements with blood and mucus with tenesmus or pain or defecation. Um, it can be associated with or without fever. And this is usually because of colonic mucosal invasion secondary to a pathogen. So bacillary um, dysentery is caused by Shigella and invasive E. coli. So when we look at Shigella, you have four species, uh, Shigella dysentery, which is um, known to cause severe, di uh, severe and epidemic disease. Uh, Shigella flexionaria and sonia are the most common species in the world. And then Shigella bordii is found in India. So these patients with Shigella tend to have bloody diarrhea with very high fevers. They have an incubation period of about six hours to nine days. And despite the intense superficial destruction, bacteremia and disseminated infections are actually quite rare here. You can have extra intestinal manifestations in the form of headache, meningism, and seizures, as well as reactive arthritis following this illness. With regards to invasive E. coli, there are five groups of E. coli um, <clears throat> that are responsible for causing diarrhea. So sugar toxin producing E. coli and enteroinvasive E. coli are responsible for uh, producing dysentery. Enteropathogenic is responsible for causing diarrhea in infants and entero aggregative E. coli causes diarrhea in travelers as well and is implicated in foodborne um, uh, diarrhea and enterotoxic is another cause of traveler's diarrhea. Then these patients usually have an incubation period of three to four days. Um, fever is minimal in these patients, so as opposed to Shigella, where you may have a high fever. Where you have a high fever in E. coli, you don't have um, a, a high fever uh, if a fever is present at all. And the major reservoir of E. coli is cattle, so anything that is derived from cattle, so milk, um, and meat products, one should be suspicious of E. coli. Uh, campylobacterosis, so uh, campylobacter enteritis is an known cause of uh, dysentery, and this is usually due to contaminated water, raw milk, uncooked meat and poultry, and um, it's known to cause complications after the acute um, infection in the form of Guillain-Barre syndrome and a reactive arthritis. Vibriosis, so Vibrio perihemolyticus, is not something that we see commonly, but um, it does present with patients who ingest um, raw seafood. And these patients usually have um, dysentery with cramps, nausea, vomiting, headache, and a fever. And then salmonellosis, typhoid fever, enteric fever. Uh, these patients usually have symptoms about 8 to 48 hours following ingestion, and it lasts about 3 to 5 days. caused by Yersinia enterocolitica, but it can also be caused by Yersinia uh, pseudotuberculosis, and patients present with uh, dysentery with associated mesenteric adenitis and an inflammatory ileitis, so almost like a pseudoappendicitis, and uh, they can cause disseminated abscesses in the liver and spleen, and this is usually through exposure um, to contaminated pork and dairy products. And then finally, amoebiasis, so entamoeba histolytica, where patients have a sustained febrile diarrhea with bloody stools, and usually the, the incidence is insidious and um, is usually, you think about it when, um, especially if the diarrhea persists for more than two, uh, two weeks, and also to, for travelers who've traveled to endemic areas. So this was um, just to look at the frequency of the, um, dysenteric illness in samples. So they did a 10-year um, a retrospective review of all articles that reported um, dysentery globally. And they found that in developing countries that I've just highlighted here, that adults, so almost 51% of patients who had Shigella presented with dysentery um, 
57.7% with Yersinia enterocolitica presented with dysentery and 7.3% um, was a non-cholera vibrio. And then in industrial um, countries, 25% was Shigella, 26 NTS, um, followed by uh, Campylobacter gigini and C. diff, as well as sugar toxin producing E. coli. So when it comes to foodborne diseases, so this can be an isolated, so this can occur as an isolated case or as an outbreak of illness affecting a group of people after a common food exposure. So a foodborne disease outbreak is considered when an acute illness, especially with gastrointestinal or neurological symptoms, affects two or more people who have shared a common meal. Um, and this usually is divided according to the time of onset of symptoms. So you have symptoms that last less than 24 hours. So these um, particular microorganisms have a short incubation or the, the, the disease caused by these microorganisms have short incubation times of one to eight hours. And this is usually due to the ingestion of preformed enterotoxins. So the first um, uh, organism that is implicated is Staph aureus food poisoning. And this is through the ingestion of uh, distinct enterotoxins, which are heat resistant and withstand ordinary cooking. And because they are resistant to proteolytic enzymes, they pass through the stomach intact and can cause vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and less commonly, fever. Bacillus cereus um, also produces enterotoxins that are heat resistant, as well as resistant to proteolytic enzymes. And they can, bacillus can cause two forms. You have a short incubation, emetic syndrome, so within half an hour to six hours of ingestion, and the vomiting is quite profound here, and this is due to the binding of the toxin to the vagus nerve through um, the 5-HT3 receptor, and then you have a long incubation diarrheal syndrome of eight to 16 hours, um, which is predominantly diarrhea um, as the presenting symptoms. Then norovirus, um, which presents with vomiting, non-bloody diarrhea, and abdominal pain and fever. So if you have someone who has ingested, um, uh, 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 you suspect contaminated food, and the symptoms last, or the onset of the symptoms are less than 24 hours post-ingestion, then you should be thinking of Staph aureus, Bacillus cereus, and norovirus. Then when patients have symptoms that then last about one to two days, so they mainly have watery diarrhea without a fever, uh, consider Clostridium um, perfringens, which is caused by um, toxins produced in the GI lumen, and the incubation period here is 9 to 12 hours, and patients usually present with diarrhea and abdominal cramps and don't really have a fever or uh, vomiting. And then bacillus serious strains can also cause, like what I had said previously, can cause this long incubation period syndrome of uh, diarrhea mainly. And then when symptoms last for more than two days and the patients have watery diarrhea and abdominal cramps, you would think of um, enterotoxigenic strains of E. coli, a Vibrio parahemolyticus, and cholera. Um, but obviously with the cholera, uh, they have more typically this profuse rice water um, stool that they present with. You also have diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and fever. And these patients may have a longer incubation period. And this is usually um, as a result of an inflammatory diarrhea where you have either invasion or the production of cytotoxins. And this usually resolves within two to seven days. So the commonly implicated organisms here are non-typhoidal salmonella. So where you have an incubation period of six to 48 hours, Clostridium gigini, where you have an incubation period of two to four days, Listeria, where you have an incubation period of 20 to 31 hours, and Yersinia enterocolitica, where you have an um, incubation period of four to six days. Bloody diarrhea with minimal fever, think of um, sugar toxin producing E. coli. And then when you have persistent diarrhea that lasts for more than two weeks, consider cryptosporidium, gerardia, cyclospora. And there's this concept of Bernard diarrhea where a pathogen has not been identified as yet, but it's postulated to be transmitted through water. And it was described first in people who ingested raw milk and unchlorinated water, where you had an incubation period of about two weeks and patients would then develop uh, persistent diarrhea that would last even up to a year. So there's still quite a lot of research on trying, trying to identify the, the implicated pathogen in this Bernard diarrhea. Then if you have diarrhea, 
Following um, that, you develop cranial nerve palsies and a descending paralysis. So suspect botulism in any patient with bilateral, uh, bilateral symmetrical cranial nerve palsies and symmetrically descending flaccid paralysis. And this is due to the ingestion of preformed toxins, which block estrogen release at the neuromuscular junction irreversibly. The regenerate very slowly, so recovery is over weeks to months. And then patients who have diarrheal illness associated with systemic illness is usually in immunocompromised patients. Um, so think of things like, in addition to the other differentials we've spoken about, um, consider things like listeria, especially in pregnant women, older adults, uh, because this can cause sepsis, meningitis, and other sites of focal infection. Vibrio falnificus, which is um, usually implicated from contaminated food, usually raw oysters, and patients can present with a bullous skin lesion in association with diarrhea. And this is especially in patients of chronic liver disease, where you have reduced vagocytic function and increased iron levels. Uh, consider non-typhoidal salmonella. Um, they can present with teremia and focal infections elsewhere. And consider this in patients at the extremes of age, those with sickle cell disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and those who are HIV positive. Campylobacter as well, and trichinolosis, which is a roundworm infection, which is found in raw undercooked pork or wild game. And this has two phases. You have an enteric phase where patients present with diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. And then you have a parenteral phase where patients present with fever, myalgia, periorbital, facial edema, as well as eosinophilia. So this is just a nice table taken from uh, this paper by Adley. And it just looks at the major foodborne pathogens, so under bacteria, and what food sources um, they would originate from. And this is important when you're taking your, your exposure history in patients who have diarrhea to ask about um, what they've eaten recently in the last few days. And it may assist you with um, uh, uh, trying to, to decide what micro or potentially think of what microorganisms may be causing this. Obviously, there is a lot of overlap between the, the food sources and the organisms, um, but it is important specifically to ask about this. So for example, with Bacillus cereus, it's usually because of meats, stews, gravies, vanilla rice. Um, Clostridium botulinum is because of improperly canned foods, especially home canned vegetables, fermented fish, baked potatoes. Um, is unpasteurized milk, soft cheese may unpasteurized milk and ready to eat delis, um, vibrio species, usually raw undercooked seafood, and Yersinia due to raw or undercooked pork, unpasteurized milk, or contaminated water. This is just to illustrate uh, food sources for viruses. So norovirus, hepatitis virus, and just note with the viruses, it's not just about the food, but also the potential for infected food handlers that may um, cause the propagation of the virus. And then parasites as well, so cryptosporidium, cyclospora, gerardia, uh, toxo, trichinella, and then the various food sources uh, mentioned here. Um, other presentations that... Um, are important is institutional diarrhea. So this includes hospitals, long-term care facilities, and daycare centers. Hospitals, the most important one that uh, should cross everybody's mind is C. difficile, um, which is the most common infectious cause. And this usually affects elderly patients, patients who've been in ICU, have been hospitalized for a prolonged period, and have had repeated and uh, multiple courses of antibiotics while um, in the hospital. Uh, there are other bacteria, for example, Klebsiella, Oxytoca, and Salmonella. Um, viruses like rotavirus, adenovirus, Coxsackie virus, noroviruses, and parasites like Tryptosporidium, which may be implicated in a hospital setting, but we don't see those commonly. In long-term care facilities, again, C. difficile is another important consideration. And in daycare centers, um, it's important to consider rotavirus, Gerardia lamblia, and Cryptosporidium as important causes of diarrhea. With regards to travel diarrhea, so it's the most common illness that threatens the traveler. It depends on the destination and the traveler characteristics. The onset is during or within 10 days of travel to a resource poor area. It usually affects people traveling from a high income to a middle and low income country. The true incidence is hard to estimate as many people don't seek medical help while they are abroad or even on their return home. And when they've looked at um, studies uh, trying to assess the, the etiology of traveler's diarrhea, in 40 to 70% of cases, there's often no identifiable pathogen. It's usually of a short duration and it's self-limiting, and more than 80% of cases resolve within a week. 
So these are factors um, that are associated with uh, increased risk of acquiring traveler's diarrhea, so backpacking, all-inclusive holidays, such as in cruise ships, and um, increased susceptibility to infectious loads, so the younger patients, use of PPIs, altered upper GI anatomy, and genetic factors, which we touched on briefly. And then risk factors uh, of travelers according to the destination. So high risk destinations are usually Asia, the Americas and Africa, and South Africa is considered a medium risk um, destination for travelers diarrhea. And um, frequency of pathogens causing travelers diarrhea is enterotoxigenic E. coli followed by enteroaggregative E. coli and um, Campylobacter gigini and rotavirus. So those are the four causes of um, travelers diarrhea. So this is a nice algorithm just to look at the causative agents of traveler's diarrhea. So if you have diarrhea um, associated with travel and it's within two weeks, if it's short-lived with vomiting only, consider rotavirus or norovirus, and this is due to uh, preformed tox or because of preformed toxins. Um, if you have acute diarrhea with watery diarrhea only, then consider enterotoxigenic and um, enteroaggregative uh, E. coli as well as aeromonas. If the watery diarrhea is associated with cramps and fever, co uh, consider Campylobacter and Salmonella. If the watery diarrhea is extremely watery, consider Vibrio cholerae. And if you've got cramps, fevers, and bloody stools, consider Campylobacter, Shigella, and Pleosiomonas. And you can have traveler's diarrhea that persists for more than two weeks after travel. In this case, if you have fever and pain with bloody stools, consider amoebic dysentery. If you have only watery diarrhea, so no blood, but the duration is more than two weeks, consider cryptosporidia. And if you have flatus and steatorrhea, consider um, Giardia lamblia. They, it is also important to, to be aware that in travelers um, who have persistent diarrhea with no of inflammation, negative microbiological investigation, that there is this um, phenomenon of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Then this is the an article in the New England Journal, which looked at enteropathogens causing uh, chronic illnesses in returning travelers. And in addition to Gerardia and Entamoeba, I just wanted to highlight Strongyloides and Schistosomiasis uh, as well. And please don't forget about malaria, because um, malaria um, in a patient with fever and diarrhea is, uh, presents almost 30 to 50% of cases in that way. So always look for it in a patient who comes back with fever and uh, who has recently traveled and presents with diarrhea, it is something to consider and to make sure that you don't miss. Then with regards to diarrhea and the immunocompromised host, so uh, you would consider all the causes um, of acute diarrhea that we've mentioned, uh, but also to consider the following for chronic diarrhea in HIV positive patients, so bacteria, um, namely Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Mycobacterium species, so that's um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis as well as NPM, C. difficile, Vibrio parahemolyticus, and intestinal spirochetes. That's given um, the proper exposure, if you've got the right exposure history. Consider viruses like CMV, HSV, fungi like Candida albicans, Blastocystis hominis, and again, depending on your demographics here, and then protozoa like Cyclospora, Cyst isospora, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, Entamoeba histolytica, and Microsporidia, and then helminths like Strongyloides. Also consider the following for patients with solid organ transplants and those receiving other immunosuppressants. So C. diff, so organ transplant on its own, um, increases your, your risk for, for C. diff. Remember that these are patients who often have frequent encounters with the healthcare system. Um, they may have prolonged hospitalization, uh, prolonged exposure to uh, multiple courses of antimicrobials, and uh, the transplant itself um, can predispose to seed of infection. Also, uh, viruses like CMV, norovirus, adenovirus, and then protozoa like cryptosporidiosis. So when looking at complications of diarrhea, um, <clears throat> it, I've divided it into those that may accompany the acute enteric infection and those that may follow the uh, acute enteric infection. So during the illness, you can look at complications within the GIT and those outside of the GIT. So within the GIT, uh, mainly there's intestinal perforation, and this is usually caused by Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, Entamoeba histolytica. You may have exacerbation of inflammatory bowel disease or the first presentation of inflammatory bowel disease um, with any infection um, <clears throat> of, the, of the GIT, including C. diff. And then pseudoappendicitis, 
um, as a complication of salmonella. Outside of the GIT, you are looking for complications like bacteremic spread, so aortitis and osteomyelitis, and this, the usual culprits here are salmonella and yersinia, um, systemic action of bacterial toxins, so causing hemolytic uremic syndrome, so sugar toxin producing bacteria, shigella dysentery type 1, and uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli. Then those that can result in seizures and meningitis are shigella and listeria. Uh, those causing erythema nodosum. So these uh, implicated pathogens are Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Campylobacter. Those that cause uh, bacteremia are non typhoidal Salmonella, Clostridium fetus, and Shigella species. And then Glomerula nephritis has been associated with Shigella, Campylobacter, and Yersinia. Looking at complications following illness, so you have reactive arthritis following Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia and um, sugar toxin producing E. coli and C. difficile infection, and then Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, uh, secondary to Clostridium jejuni infection, and this is due to the antibody cross-reactivity and molecular mimicry, and then you have irritable bowel syndrome, and this can be due to multiple and several pathogens, and then chronic diarrhea, which uh, follows travelers, following travelers' diarrhea, and this usually occurs in 1% of, of travelers' um, who have persistent diarrhea. And then you have asymptomatic passage of enteropathogens. And this is um, with non-typhoidal salmonella, Clostridium jejunum, and norovirus. So when looking at diagnostic testing, it's important to take a very detailed history of travel to any endemic area, exposure history, history of similar illnesses in others, and place of work. So if they work in childcare centers, food services, recreational water venues, or even the laboratory, um, there's a slide that I'll put up, which is a, a nice table from the IDSA guidelines, which just has a nice um, um, uh, table looking at the possible exposures and what microorganisms you would think of, uh, depending on, on the exposure history. So these, the, the, reference, the reference for these diagnostic testing is taken from the IDSA 2017 guidelines on the investigations and management of um, infectious diarrhea. So in terms of blood investigations, so blood cultures are recommended in patients with signs suggestive of septicemia, when you suspect enteric fever, in immunocompromised patients with a fever, and immunocompromised patients who uh, a bacterial pathogen has been detected by stool testing to assess for bacteremia. Um, you monitor the white cell count, hemoglobin, platelets, and renal function, and this really to detect complications related to the diarrhea, so hemolytic uremic syndrome in the case of um, sugar toxin E. coli, and complications of C. diff. You may do a bone marrow or check geonal fluid and urine if there is a concern for enteric fever. Um, this is just a recommendation. It's not to say that you should do it, but you can do it because the yield from blood culture for for enteric fever is only about 50%. And so you may get a better yield on other specimens like um, a bone marrow. With regards to stool testing, so fresh stool is recommended to check for Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, C. diff, and sugar toxin producing E. coli and Vibrio species. Um, if you do detect um, sugar toxin uh, producing E. you must screen for, for um, uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli 0157 by culture. And I'll explain this a bit more when we come to um, treatment. C. diff testing as indicated, so you have GDH and toxin detection, um, and that's mainly with patients who have hospital exposure or who have had a travel history with antibiotic use in the last eight to 12 weeks. Parasites, ova, and viruses you would want to do in patients who are immunocompromised or, uh, or in traveler's diarrhea where the diarrhea lasts for more than 14 days. There is no role for fecal uh, leukocytes and lactoferrin testing because um, there's insufficient data to, um, in terms of guiding the etiologies of an infectious diarrhea. It may be able to help differentiate a secretory diarrhea um, versus an, an uh, inflammatory or infectious diarrhea, but it doesn't help in terms of trying to differentiate what the possible etiology is in terms of bacterial, viral, protozoal, or helminths. Serial testing is often not recommended, but um, it is done in certain situations as per local guidelines. And this is in the case of Salmonella, Shigella, and Enterotoxigenic E. coli. 
and this is to assess whether and this is mainly due to the concern for prolonged carriage and this is to assess whether patients can return to employment um, return to group social activities and uh, for children to return to uh, child care imaging of the abdomen and other sites are done to assess for complications so for example with salmonella and concern for intestinal proliferation or c diff with a concern of toxic megacolon or Yersinia, where there's a concern for disseminated hepatic or splenic abscesses, or in the case of Salmonella, again, where you're concerned about aortitis or osteomyelitis, imaging may be indicated in, in those particular um, scenarios. Endoscopy, proctoscopy, is mainly indicated for patients with persistent and unexplained diarrhea, HIV positive patients with chronic diarrhea, and acute diarrhea with clinical colitis or proctitis. And just to emphasize for patients, HIV positive with chronic diarrhea, it's important to push for endoscopy with a biopsy for these patients. Often the, um, the stool microscopy culture uh, over and parasites may be negative when it's sent off in the ward and patients are discharged home, but still have this persistent diarrhea and they come back and the same thing is done that's regarded as negative and they sent home again. And it's important to, to consider that there are pathogens, for example, the parasites like cyst isospora, um, cryptosporidium, that may only be detected by endoscopy and biopsy, even if the, the the upper end is reported as normal, you may not have overt pathological changes that are macroscopically um, obvious. And so biopsies are quite important. And that's an important thing to consider, especially in our patient um, cohort. Um, <clears throat> this was the table I was talking about, which shows the exposure or condition associated with the pathogen, pathogen causing diarrhea. So you have foodborne um, exposure. So it looks at, like, for example, outbreaks in uh, hotels, cruise ships, resorts. Um, when you consume unpasteurized milk or dairy products, what you're at risk for, uh, consumption of raw shellfish, it looks at exposure to, to um, water sources. So you're at risk, for example, um, <clears throat> while swimming or drinking in uh, untreated fresh water for Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, Gerardia, um, swimming in recreational water facilities with treated water, you'd be concerned about Cryptosporidium. Um, and then it looks at the various centers that patients may be in. So health care, long-term care centers, prison exposure, child care centers, if the patients have had recent antimicrobial therapy, um, exposure to pets, house pets with diarrhea, exposure to pig feces in certain parts of the world, um, visiting a farm or a petting zoo, and uh, exposure according to age and comorbidity. So age group uh, if you're young or older, um, what microorganisms you would be more prone to getting, underlying immunocompromised conditions. Um, <clears throat> and if you've got um, anal, genital, oral, anal, and digital anal contact, um, what microorganisms you would be concerned about. And this is especially important um, because you would consider STIs here in addition to uh, what we've already mentioned. With regards to management, so rehydration is always number one. So this can be either oral or intravenously. Um, like I said, with oral in the beginning, the one of the, the factors that have been looked at that may potentially have contributed to the reduction of diarrheal related deaths is the self-treatment of, um, of diarrheal illnesses at home. And it's through this education of this oral rehydration solution. So this is where you have a liter of water that's boiled and you add six teaspoons of sugar and half a teaspoon of salt. And um, adults are advised to have up to three liters a day to keep up with losses. Otherwise, if the patients are sick enough, then they would be admitted and receive intravenous therapy. So antibiotics are only indicated in the following conditions. So if you have suspected enteric fever following collection of appropriate cultures, if that is possible, um, ill immunocompetent patients with a fever that's documented in a medical setting with abdominal pain, or uh, patients who have bloody diarrhea or bacillary dysentery, immunocompromised patients with severe illness or bloody diarrhea, a history of travel internationally, with a temperature of more than 38 degrees or signs of sepsis, asymptomatic patients with salmonella enterica due to the risk of transmission. So these patients are at risk of prolonged carriage and transmission, patients with confirmed C. difficile infection and directed therapy for confirmed chronic diarrhea. In the case where we are treating empirically 
for, for patients who come in with diarrhea. I'm not sure how it is in other centers, but in our center, there's almost this reflex to put any patient um, who presents with diarrhea for any duration on ciprofloxacin and uh, metronidazole. And it's just to emphasize that we should be assessing these parameters of fever, whether the patients are hemodynamically stable, they're not severely dehydrated or have septic shock and looking at whether they have bloody diarrhea. And if that is the case, then the recommendation is to start with the oral fluoroquinolone. So in the form of ciprofloxacin or azithromycin, depending on your local susceptibility pattern and depending on where they've traveled, for example, in the case of travelers, um, the use of, of metronidazole for, two, um, for two, two reasons. One, that you're suspecting entamoeba histolytica, so amoebiasis, or you're suspecting gerardia. Otherwise, this empiric regimen of giving everybody um, diarrhea, even if it's not bloody, of ciprofloxacin and metronidazole is not good practice. Antibiotics are not recommended in the following. So with toxin producing E. coli 0157, and um, shigatoxin E. coli producing shigatoxin 2. And this is because it augments your risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. And this is actually quite controversial. The thought behind this and the recommendation in the IDSA guidelines is that um, treatment should be avoided, so antimicrobial treatment should be avoided um, in patients who have confirmed shigatoxin producing E. coli um, with shigatoxin 2 production or 157 strains. And this is because it's thought that the antimicrobial causes DNA damage, which triggers this um, bacterial response that increases the expression um, of, of uh, sugar toxin and they actually increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. There are a few smaller studies that have shown that giving antibiotics earlier may actually prevent HUS, um, but looking at the data um, and reviewing the data as a whole, the IDSA have felt that it's it, there's enough to say that antimicrobial therapy in this setting may actually do more harm um, than good. Asymptomatic contacts of people with dysentery don't need anti antibiotics. Patients with persistent watery diarrhea don't need antibiotics. So because the causes now, once you move away from the 14-day mark, is usually going to be parasitic or other um, viruses or protozoa, depending on your... On your um, your patient profile and exposure history. Asymptomatic contacts of people with persistent watery diarrhea also don't need antibiotics as prophylaxis. Anti-motility drugs, um, so in immunocompetent adults with acute watery diarrhea, there is weak evidence to suggest that you may use anti-motility drugs like loperamide. And then in traveler's diarrhea, when dysentery has been ruled out, has been shown to reduce the, um, the, vo the, well, the frequency and the volume of, of stool in, in uh, travelers. Probiotics have also been used to um, have been recommended in the guideline, and this is to decrease the symptom severity and duration in immunocompetent adults with infectious or antibiotic associated um, diarrhea. And then just, this is just the table, so I know it's a bit busy, but this is from the IDSA guideline, and it's just to um, talk about or first choice and alternative choice in terms of antibiotic therapy. So with bacteria like Campylobacter, um, um, Salmonella, and um, Yersinia, your first your antibiotic of choice will be a oral, oral quinolone, so ciprofloxacin. And then if you're concerned about NTS, you may use rosifen or for vibrio cholerae or non-vibrio uh, cholerae, you can add doxycycline. And this is for the chronic diarrheas, so cryptosporidium, gerardia, cyst isospora, trichinella, and tells you what antibiotic you can use here. So this is just a nice summary table of the antibiotics that you can use. The duration of antibiotic therapy is usually three days um, for ciprofloxacin. And then if you're using um, metronidazole for treatment of, um, um, for a bloody diarrhea caused by amoebiasis or um, gerardia, usually you would treat for about five days. Then lastly, with regards to prevention, so um, according to the World Health Organization, there are seven main steps to the prevention of diarrheal illnesses. So hand washing with soap, um, good personal and food hygiene. So this includes proper food preparation and storage, avoiding high risk foods such as soft cheese from unpasteurized milk, unpasteurized milk itself, undercooked meat and seafood, 
um, access to safe drinking water, improved sanitation, health education about how infections spread, and this applies to travelers as well, the use of IPC um, in hospitals, childcare, nursing home settings, educating about the appropriate use of antibiotics and PPIs, um, and if patients do have diarrhea and are symptomatic, that they should refrain from recreational water activities, food preparation and services, and uh, sexual activities while they're symptomatic. Exclusive breastfeeding in the first six months of life, and then rotavirus vaccination for, um, for children. Um, typhoid and cholera vaccines are available and uh, are usually advocated for travelers when they're going to endemic areas. Um, thank you. So. That's it for me. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Sharon. So um, an alarming last photo. Um, the, uh, questions and comments from, from, from people in the audience. Um, while, while people think and, 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 and type, um, could you go back to the, um, the antibiotic recommendations in terms of empiric antibiotics? So I think directed antibiotics make sense or, or in many cases. If you go back a bit, um, to the to the empiric. Uh, is it this one, Jamie? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, the so I mean, effectively, if we take out so there's a couple of things. Obviously, in, in most of our practice, we could um, we move. So I mean, travel internationally. That's you know, those are those are from the IDSA guidelines. In other words, you're usually traveling somewhere outside of um, America. You know, and bringing it back in our country, that's not, you know, that's obviously less relevant because, for example, they would include anyone who traveled to South Africa <laughs> as a, yeah, as an indication to treat. So, who would you treat in, in our setting in, in most cases? So, let's, let's, and let's, let's, I mean, so for example, um, a patient with typhoid, okay, that, that we can probably remove too. So, for the purposes of the kind of the, the audience and, and obviously directed therapy, we're not so, so empiric therapy. It's really you looking at severe illness. Um, which really means diarrhea badly enough to be hospitalized, right? Yes. Um, yeah. In most cases, um, dysentery in most cases, well, at least in many cases, you'd treat. Do you know why yeah. they want a fever in, in immunocompetent people as well? Um, this, uh, I, I don't know if there's a split. I'm, I'm assuming maybe because of the, um, you want to see the systemic effects from the diarrhea. So, for example, if it's toxin mediated, that you might have a profound inflammatory response that results in a fever. And so the illness may be more severe in that case, because yeah, usually so for immunocompetent patients, it, it's, you know, it's self-limiting. So it's just local. So gastrointestinal symptoms are not, uh, they don't usually have a lot of systemic effects. Yeah. So the, the, it's, it's interesting, actually. So the, the sugar toxin producing strains typically don't give you a fever. And that's yes. pretty helpful. So in other words, that's why they want the fever there, really. It's because you don't want to give them to sugar toxin producing people. So, sure. um, so that's, as you say, so if you mean a competent, you really only get it in the IDSA guidelines, barring a few exceptions, you know, where, where like you've traveled to, you know, Mozambique, let's say, and you come back to the water. Diet. You, you really need a, a dysentery um, plus fever, really, to get, to get antibiotics in, in most cases. And when you're immunocompromised, they will give it for watery diarrhea too. So not, not necessarily just dysentery, but for watery diarrhea, provided it's bad enough to be hospitalized. Um, and that, those really is the, the bunch. That's probably 90% of scenarios. You know, I mean, there, there are a few other kind of edge case indications, as you rightly said, you know, if you happen to, you know, to have, uh, like I said, you've just come back from, let's say, Mozambique, and you've sampled everything in without washing your hands and you, you back here with a really you know with a bad watery diarrhea even though you've been a competent you know in many cases people would give antibiotics and i think that's fair but in most cases as you said if you mean a competent you need dysentery and a fever and if you mean a compromised you need that or would also give for severe illness even if it's watery um and and that really is that's you know in, in a one-line summary that's it for for most cases there are a few extra edge cases as you rightly said but far less than people think um, cool. Thanks, Jamie. And then, no, no. I mean, you, well, you. I'm just kind of reiterating for the audience. You, you've got it on the slide already. Um, you know, which is, which is great. Um, I'm looking at the questions. There's a question about using Spectre for acute diarrhea. In, in this uh, anti-diarrheal agent. I so, I think Smecta is. I'm not sure what the mechanism of action of Smecta is. 
So if it is an antidiarrheal agent, like I said, the antidiarrheal agent for, I mean, according to these guidelines for immunocompetent adults with acute watery diarrhea and travelers, but really the evidence is very weak here. Um, other than that, I, I honestly don't know much about Smecta to, to, to answer further. Yeah, so it's, I mean, you, you had it in, the, in terms of the, what, what you, would you use if you use anything? So the best evidence is for lopiramide. Um, yeah. Other than than Spectre or or other antidiarrheal agents, um, it, it's not to say it doesn't work. Obviously, it's just to say the evidence is best for it, and that it appears not just that there's most evidence for it, but it also it appears that it might work better. Um, although, as you rightly said, um, relatively low quality evidence across the board. Um, and then, and then, sorry, there's a question about saying asking you, Sharon, would you mind elaborating on the role of antibiotics in asymptomatic? Salmonella entericus, in other words, typhoid again? Sure. So for patients who have had um, typhoid fever, there is a concern for this prolonged carriage status, in which case they may be uh, shedding the bacteria but not having any symptoms. And in those patients, you, you do, I mean, there are some recommendations for some societies that recommend for um, serial testing of, of uh, stool samples of patients who've had typhoid to see if they are chronic carriers. And in, if they are, they, they, it's advocated that those patients be um, treated with antibiotics to reduce transmission to, to other people, especially um, food handlers. The contacts of these patients don't need um, antibiotics, but if they are confirmed to have this chronic carrier state, then they should be treated with antibiotics until the stool is clear. Mm, yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, agreed. Um, and that includes obviously our own South African and NRCD guidelines. Yes. Should yeah. Recommend that too. Yeah, that's yeah, that's perfect. Great. Well, thank you. I think we're going to leave it there just because we, we're out of time. But thank you very much, Sharon. It's a really, really cool. great overview. Um, lots of nice comments coming through on the chat and on my on my phone as well. So thank you very much.